welcome to Next Level Play Therapy, a weekly podcast dedicated to supporting the next generation of child and adolescent therapists to provide exceptional play therapy services. We'll explore all things play therapy to elevate your work with children and adolescents using the therapeutic powers of play. I'll discuss practical tips and ideas so you can provide a transformative experience for your young clients and make a real difference in their lives. So get ready to take your play therapy skills to the next level and make a lasting impact in the lives of children, adolescents, and families. Hey there, welcome to this week's episode of Next Level Play Therapy. Today, we're going to discuss a topic that comes up all the time. And this is something in my Play Therapy Academy program, which is my online consultation program, um, that comes up all the time. And and I also think if you're kind of new to play therapy or you're beginning to figure out which direction you want to go using play therapy and how you want to use play therapy. Today's topic is one of those things I think all of us in the play therapy field have had to figure out. And sometimes that takes a while. And it can be a little, I think nowadays, because there's so much online training, which is awesome. We didn't have that when I was just getting started. And I think what happens is a lot of opportunities provide a lot of choices, and then a lot of choices create some dilemmas about what should I do. And so that's why I thought today's topic would be useful, which is, is there a best play therapy approach? What's the best approach to play therapy? This is kind of a question that comes up all the time when play therapists are trying to figure out how to best help their clients. How can I help my clients heal? What can I do that's going to make a difference in their lives? And is there is there a best approach I should be using? And I, I think it's an important topic to consider so you can avoid what I call throwing spaghetti against the wall meaning you're using all kinds of different interventions and trying different kinds of things because you're a little concerned that maybe nothing's working. So you're kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping something sticks with your interventions. But then what ends up happening is you, you feel like nothing's working and your imposter syndrome begins to kick in. So, and then you feel like you're not making a difference. So today's topic is, is there a best approach to play therapy? And I would love to see who is watching live today. So I I stream live every week into LinkedIn and uh, YouTube and also on my Instagram channel. I put the replays in my Facebook group. I used to be able to live stream into my Facebook group, but then um, Meta changed their requirements and I didn't want to make the switch. So (laughs) that is what it is. But um, so I'd love to see who's here. And if you're watching the replay, I would love to see who's here, even on the replay. So post your name in the comments what population you work with, um, what play therapy model are you using, what questions do you have about using a play therapy model. Go ahead and post those in the comments. If you are listening on the podcast, please feel free to leave comments. Send me an email if you have questions. Um, And let's get started. So, is one is one type of play therapy best? That's the first question, right? Is there one type of play therapy model that is going to be the magic 
magic ingredient to make that difference that you want to make in the lives of your clients. And why is that important? Because the so here in the United States, our kind of play therapy um, association that we follow that also establishes best practices and also develop competencies for play therapy, the Association for Play Therapy has established what they call core competencies using play therapy. The reason for this, like any field, you want to establish some competencies to make sure the services that you're providing are effective and based on sound theoretical principles and applied with skill. So this is really about developing um, core standards across the profession. And one of the core competencies that um, have been established is that play therapists will have knowledge of what they call seminal and historical theoretical models, play therapy models. Why is that important? Because it grounds the profession in a theoretical orientation to the work that we do, meaning we want to learn a theory because theory drives application. And there are um, some theories that have become the core of the play therapy profession, at least here in the United States, I suspect outside of the United States as well. And so they call uh, the Association for, for Play Therapy calls them um, seminal and historical models. Now, why, why is that important? Because theory drives application and guides you through all of the different stages of the change process and helps you understand how you're supposed to be in play therapy sessions, what you say, what you don't say, how do you say it, how do you identify and make sense of the themes that you're seeing in the play therapy process, how do you know when your client is progressing based on the different stages. Um, so those are all really important. So hey there, Britt from Ohana Means Family. I love your posts. So uh Britt is on Instagram, and so I follow you, and I, I love your posts, so I just had to say that. Um, still having difficulty sticking to one model. You know what? I, I think that is a problem most play therapists struggle with, at least in the beginning. And I think part, well, it's been my experience working with a lot of people over the last 15 years doing consulting is you're, you start not knowing and not feeling confident in the skills that you're using. And, I, you know, we all do that. I did it too. Um, and that's part of, I think that's where consultation really makes a difference in making sure you get some good training to kind of help you know how to apply the skills and kind of feel confident through all of the stages um, the other thing I find is maybe you haven't found one that has aligned, um, but I still, to this day, I mean, I, I could, if I don't make myself kind of focus, I can go down lots of different rabbit holes <laughs> with different theories because there's so many good things about all of them. Um, but there's a, there's a, um, there's a thing called the Dodo Verdict. So the Dodo verdict says that all treatment approach, all treatment approaches will work equally well with all clients to overcome whatever issue that they've experienced. The thing is that has been widely disputed in, among the experts that not all treatment models work hundred percent with all clients and all client presenting issues. So learning, um, learning one theoretical model is good because I think that it grounds you is one theory model, the end all be all for all theory models. 
I don't think so. I think that's a lot of why we're seeing what I call the next generation of play therapy models that are a lot more integrative based off of those seminal and hyster hysterical models, historical, not hysterical, seminal and historical models, because now we're getting a lot more research from about neuroscience and understanding that brain body connection. So like Britt from Ohana Means Family says, I love synergistic, which is more of an integrative model that kind of has its roots in a theoretical model, and then also integrated in what we're learning with research about neuroscience. So I'm even a big, like my initial training way, way, way back in the day um, was child-centered play therapy. When, when I am using child-centered play therapy with young kids, because I, I think for that population, child-centered play therapy works really well for the really little kids. Uh, but I also use that kind of neuroscience and attachment lens that to me makes that theory model so much richer. So I, I would say I use more of an attachment and neuroscience lens, even when I'm using child centered play therapy. But I think most of us, um, this is my opinion, I, you may or may not agree if you're a child centered play therapist, I think there's a point in time when child centered play therapy doesn't work as well for the vast majority of clients. And I think once they get up to be like that nine or 10, definitely 10, um, if you are using child centered play therapy, it has to look a little different than it does with the younger kids. I think a lot, of, and so more kind of integrated versions when you get to older kids. But the thing is, what model are you using? because that's how you are going to identify what kind of interventions do I want to use? What are the different stages of change look, look for? When I, see the, when I see the themes, how am I making sense of those? What theory model am I using to understand and conceptualize what's going on with my client and where they are in the change process? So Britt says, I wish could see more actual sessions. I feel like that would be super helpful. Yeah. And she also says neuroscience and attachment is huge. Yeah, we definitely align there for sure. Um, and um, so when you're when you're thinking about what theory theoretical model, why is that important? It's important because it grounds the work that you do and helps you get through all of the different stages of the change process. Even now, when we've moved to a lot of uh, having access to a lot of integrated models, they're still based in a theoretical lens, some kind of framework that helps you know where you are in the change process and what's going on with your client. So, the, your theory model is going to influence also how are you integrating parents into the change process? So for child-centered play therapy, they're never going to be in the session with you. And if you want to integrate them in, that's a different model. So the way child-centered play therapy involves parents is through those separate parent coaching sessions which are very, very important. So just because you're using child-centered play therapy doesn't mean you're not involving parents. You are involving parents. And meeting with parents to facilitate that change within the child's environment is critical for that lasting change that you want to happen. And I've talked about this a lot on previous episodes where... Um, how you how are you integrating parents in the play therapy process? That's really, really important because children can't be their therapeutic agents of change. 
parents need to be the therapeutic agents of change. So as play therapists, how are we integrating them? How are we supporting them? Our theory model is going to make sense of how we understand the parent's role in the change process. Adlerian play therapy and gestalt play therapy will conceptualize the child's environment in the treatment process, which I love that. And how you integrate parents will be influenced by your theoretical model. So the way that an Adlerian play therapist works with families and understands and conceptualizes the problem will likely be slightly different because it's a different theory model than Gestalt play therapy. So that's why it's really important to really understand the importance of learning a theory model and using it. So then that comes to the next question, which is, how do I choose a play therapy theoretical? Oh, sorry, I skipped one. What uh, what does theory have to do with the results? That's the next question. And I've kind of talked about that already, but what I haven't talked about yet is that your play therapy model is how you help your clients access those therapeutic powers of play. The therapeutic powers of play are what set play therapy apart from the other expressive arts expressive arts modalities so how are you helping your clients access those therapeutic powers of play and it's also going to influence your way of being in the play therapy session so as a child-centered play therapist i'm going to show up slightly differently in the way in which i speak the way in which i interact how I respond to questions, that'll be a little different than if I'm using a different theory model. Sometimes your theory model will influence whether the child is leading or if you're leading. In child-centered play therapy, you never lead. In the other play therapy models, sometimes you lead, sometimes the child leads. And that really depends on a variety of factors. So your play, your play therapy model also influences how you're going to choose interventions, what kind of interventions you're going to choose. Um, so like, for example, even when you're using more of an integrative model, it's going to be based, your, your choice of interventions is going to be based based on, my mouth isn't working so well today, <laughs> your choice of, of interventions is going to be based on your theory model and how you understand what the problem is. Because you're going to choose interventions based on how you're understanding what the problem is. And then that's going to be the focus of the change process. So how are you choosing your interventions will be based on your theory theory model. So like even if you're using prescriptive play therapy or more of an integrative play therapy model, the there are theories and principles underlying how you're helping your clients access those therapeutic process, uh, powers of play and how you're identifying progress. So like I would consider synergistic play therapy an inner an uh, integrative model, but it's a specific kind of interventive uh, integrative model. We now have a lot of models in play therapy where people specialize in using neuroscience and polyvagal, and that is the theoretical foundation of the work that you're using. And I, I think that's awesome. I love neuroscience and attachment theory. I love that we are having some of these new, um, I call them next generation models. The thing you have to keep in mind is those models are, are founded on certain principles and a theoretical lens. And that's how you're understanding where, where your clients are in the change process. So I, I would say that my foundation from grad school back in the 90s 
um, is family systems theory. That was the theory I was trained in when I was in graduate school for social work. It was all family systems theory. The work that we did was family systems. My first job out of grad school um, was working with children and adolescents and families experiencing addiction. And so we used a lot of family systems back then. And I would say that's kind of my default mode. And then along the way, I discovered uh, Daniel Siegel and interpersonal neurobiology and attachment theory. And I, I was hooked. So I, I would say those are, are my really kind of grounded. So when I look at what's going on in children's lives and I look systemically, then for me, that means how am I going to help children heal within the context of their most important relationships, meaning family, right? And family is going to be different based on what's going on for the child. So maybe it's their biological parents. Maybe it's not their biological parents. And maybe they're living with other family members who are acting in that parenting role. So when I say parents, I kind of, it's kind of a global, it's more about who's acting in that parenting role for the child. Um, Britt says family systems is big, makes so much sense nothing happens in a vacuum. Absolutely. I say that all the time. And so when I was thinking about how to integrate family and do family, there wasn't a lot. And so I kind of developed a model called attachment focused family play therapy. And the model is based on neuroscience, attachment and family systems. And based on those Based on those theory models, you're going to see certain things and different stages of the change process. And so when I was creating the, the model, because I don't like a prescribed model, <laughs> I have a really hard time following manualized things. <laughs> um, I needed something that would be a little more flexible, that also integrated attachment theory and what we were learning about more interpersonal neurobiology and the whole neuroscience field. And so um, how I'm going to conceptualize what's going on for my client using attachment focused family play therapy and what I'm going to be doing when I'm integrating that model into the overall treatment process, then I'm going to be looking for certain things. The, the way in which I show up in the play therapy sessions will depend on what stage of treatment we're in. I'm going to be working heavily with parents. What is that going to look like? I'm going to be teaching them some attachment-based parenting skills so that they can use those in everyday life. And we're practicing in the sessions. How do I do that? How do I teach them? How do I help them use that? What are we going to be doing in the sessions? What are we going to do, be doing in different phases of the change process? All of that is going to be dependent on the theory model that I'm using. So that's why theory does have a lot to do with the results. If you're using a theory model, it's going to help you not use the spaghetti against the wall. <laughs> Um, technique or get lost in throwing spaghetti against the wall and then get frustrated and confused and feel lost and overwhelmed and frustrated. That's where your theory model helps guide you through that process. So that has everything to do with um, what does theory have to do with the results in play therapy. So then that brings us to the final question, which is how do I choose a play therapy model. So before I get into that question, I have to make my disclaimer. If you've been on some of my other live stream broadcasts, or you've watched the replays, or maybe you've been listening to my podcast, Next Level Play, play uh, Next Level uh, Play Therapy Podcast, 
you will know what I'm about to say. <laughs> You've heard this before. So my dogs are now in the room with me and my, I have two. L Lily is the little one. She's our senior dog. And then we have Luna. She's our middle-aged dog. And Luna likes to come in and roll around on the carpet and she makes moaning noises. And then she digs in the carpet. You may see her to, if you're watching the video, video, you can, you might be able to see her in the back if she walks around uh, but you can hear her now if you can hear her she's she's rolling around making moaning noises although oh she's leaving now you might hear her barking then um, and Lily is under my feet under my desk so if you hear weird strange noises I promise you I'm not doing something uh, strange and untoward <laughs> in the background it is my dogs. They like to be in the room with me. So, okay, final final question for today um, to answer is how do I choose a play therapy model? This one comes up all the time um, and it can be a little frustrating. I think the best way to figure out what play th therapy model works best for you is to figure out what theory model you kind of align with what theory model and what principles of that theory model do you align with and which ones align with your therapeutic beliefs about how to do play, uh, how to do play therapy, how to work with clients, how to work with parents, how to which ones align with your values and beliefs about healing and the change process and which one, which theory model works best for the specific population that you're dealing with? So if you work primarily with um, young kids, like I'm um, three, four, five, six, seven, you probably want to make sure you're choosing a theory model that works well with that population. If you work well, uh, if you work predominantly with um, like court involved families, foster care, have a lot of trauma and attachment, you probably want to use a model that aligns with that theory model. And there are some good ones out there for all of these. So, so when you're figuring it out, th those are the things that you want to think uh, about when you're learning specific models. What I would say is learn, this part takes patience and probably a little bit of self-control. That's what I had to say to myself when I was in this stage. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Stick, learn at least one model well before you start moving on to other ones. Like, learn a theory model, learn how it applies in the different stages of the change process before you start using different interventions and kind of throwing them in your sessions kind of haphazardly. Learn a model, learn how to apply it all the way through the change process. That's the hard part. To me, that's where consultation comes in, um, comes in to be really important kind of having someone or a group of people that you're meeting with that really help you through all of those stages of the change process. That's one of the reasons I created Play Therapy Academy to, to provide that support for play therapists and give them a lot of, a lot of support. Um, because we all need help guiding us you know, through that process of learning and applying the skills and persevering to see how it actually applies. Somebody to boost up our confidence, give us some courage, tell us we're doing a good job when we think we're not because they've actually kind of had a chat with us and <laughs> realized we actually are doing a good job. Um, so that is it for today. Um, let me do a quick recap of what we talked about today. If you're interested in some of my trainings, 
then you probably want to hang in there to the end. I will talk to you a little bit about my new training. Uh, it's a live webinar that I have coming up called Attachment Focused Family Plate Therapy, where I teach you the model that I talked about earlier. But I also have some other courses. Um, oh, and Brett says, yes, I also have a book called Attachment Focused Family Plate Therapy. Um, and you can you can get that wherever you buy books. You can get it on Amazon. You can go over to Rutledge, which is the publisher, and look for it on that website. Um, so yes, that's another way you can learn that. And I'm going to talk about the model. So if you want, for those of you who are interested in it and you want to do a live webinar, um, or maybe you can't attend a live webinar, there's going the recording will be available later. So I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. I also have courses on my website that you might be interested in that talk a lot about what we've talked about today. So you might be interested in those. So quick recap, is one play therapy model best? Um, there, what I'm about to say might upset some people. Um, I don't think so. Is, is there really a best play therapy model that works for all children in all phases of life for all symptoms? I would say no. I would say some models are more versatile than other models to be able to adapt to all of the stages um, of child development, you know, like what ages and what's going on. I, I do think there are some models that are much more versatile. Um, and now we're using a lot more integrative models like prescriptive play therapy is a model that where you're prescriptively matching the theory model that you're using to the specific issue your client is facing. That being said, that you're going to use the principles of the theory model that you're using. So prescriptive play therapy is much more of an integrative model in nature, and it's focused on what they call prescriptive matching. So whatever is going on with your client, you're going to use a model that best addresses those issues your client is facing. Nowadays, we have a lot more integrative models. Um, which I think allows a lot more versatility. So I, I think there are some play therapy models that are more effective across a wide spectrum. Um, and research has shown us that not every model works the best for every single situation. So um, is there one type that works best? Yes and no. I think some work better across all the stages than others. And not everything works for every client. Does, does, so what does theory have to do with your results in play therapy? The key, the key is to recognize that your play therapy is grounded in a theoretical model that helps you that dictates how your clients are going to access those therapeutic powers of play within the context of a strong therapeutic relationship. So your theory model is also going to help you understand where you are in this change process. What stage of change are you in? And how are you understanding what the problem is? So that helps you figure out what intervention you're going to use and your interventions are going to help your clients access those therapeutic powers of play. So the thing that keeps us from, from going into kind of a haphazard throwing spaghetti against the wall is really having um, a model that we're using that grounds the work that we're doing. How do you choose a play therapy model? I would say the best play therapy model is the model that aligns with, with, with your values, your beliefs about the healing process, 
um, and how you like showing up in the playroom. And it and use that, th learn at least one theory model, learn at least one that you feel like you align with and learn to do that one well before you start adding on other things. So you wanna choose a model that also meets the needs of your specific population um, so that the one you're, you're using, you, you know, will help the population that you're working with. If you're more of a generalist and you work with a variety of different presenting problems, then you want to choose one that, that fits that population. If you work with a wide variety of ages, then choose a model that will be effective and help you do that. So that is all for today. If you found this information helpful, please feel free to share it across your social media platforms. If you're watching on live stream uh, on YouTube, please feel free to like and subscribe to my channel so that you get notified anytime there's a new live stream coming up. Um, if you're listening on the podcast, I would love love to get your feedback, please feel free to leave a review. So that is it for today. I will see you next week. Bye for now. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Next Level Play Therapy. I hope you found the discussion valuable and gained new insights and ideas to support your work helping children, adolescents, and families heal. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. Your feedback helps to improve and reach more people who can benefit from this information. Remember, play therapy is a powerful tool for healing and growth. Whether you're a new play therapist or experienced, I encourage you to continue your learning journey to unlock the potential of play in your own work and relationships. If you have any questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, I'd love to hear from you. Connect with me on social media and visit my website at Renewing Hearts Play Therapy Training to stay updated on upcoming episodes, trainings, and resources. Thank you once again for listening to Next Level Play Therapy. Until next time, keep playing, learning, and growing.